Dr. Leppert is Regents Professor and Moore, Morse Alumni Distinguished Teaching Professor in the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. In addition to A Sound World Scene for the Art of Music, his recent publications include Sound Judgment from the Ashgate series, Contemporary Thinkers on Musicology, and Aesthetic Technologies of Modernity, Subjectivity, and Nature, published this year by the University of California Press. Today, Dr. Leppert's paper, Musical Looking and Some Consequences, will examine the nature of musical instruments in their production of music and associated meetings and notions of class, gender, and power. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leppert. The one striking, indeed remarkable, feature of an Erard uh, grand pianoforte from about 1840, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, is its satin wood marquetry case, probably the most exquisite intarsias of any musical instrument ever made, the work of one George Henry Blake. The instrument's owner, Thomas Henry, 4th Baron Foley of Kidderminster, is identified by inclusion of his coat of arms, monogram, and cornet. The insignia of several previous generations of family members are also incorporated as part of the instrument's elaborate decorative scheme. The piano stood in the family's gigantic, lavish country residence, Whitley Court in Herefordshire, which was destroyed by fire in 1937, but is still extant as a burned out stone shell. The Foley's were English aristocrats at a time when noble lineage no longer carried the guarantee of cachet that bloodline alone once claimed. The newly emerging manufacturing class was already on the way to overtaking the aristocracy's long established status in the various domains of social authority, political power, and economic circumstance. Within this context, the Foley's stunning piano insistently asserts the family's genealogical pedigree and presumably the security of their fortunes despite the tide of history um, in a dramatically changing new world order. In a way, the Foley Grand was a kind of metaphor of protest against an uncertain future. It was also an instance of protesting rather too much. In the homes of the super rich, the grand piano commonly if hardly always functioned as high caste furniture. Indeed, whether it was actually played was rather less important than the semiotics proclaimed by its look alone, to say nothing of the space required to exhibit it to full advantage. Indeed, such pianos didn't need to be played in order to justify the expense of their purchase. The grand piano, notably advertent, helped to underscore the owner's social standing, wealth, and attendant taste, whether real or merely imagined. Standing silent is furniture, thus in contradiction to its presumed musical function. Such instruments bespoke what mattered most about a family, precisely by the casual absence of any felt need for it actually to be used. As part and parcel of the vast caches of stuff that commonly filled the domestic enclosures of the Victorian well-to-do, and if to a lesser extent those of their social climbing, economic, and social inferiors of the mid middling orders, the instrument's social purpose was fundamentally fulfilled simply by the fact of its observable existence. In short, and above all, the Foley Grand was an expensive piece of family propaganda. The instrument's working parts, its guts, so to speak, are essentially identical to those of other grand pianos built by Erard during this period. They are state of the art, especially the double escapement action, which was the best then available. Such instruments' modernity is further reflected in their quasi-assembly line manufacture, whatever the uniqueness of the case decoration. Indeed, as has been well established, the piano was one of the most striking success stories of early industrial technology, and for that matter, of capitalist economic expansion and mass marketing. But for the moneyed classes, mass production had a downside to the extent that the upper class identity was self-marketed by the degree of its uniqueness. No worries here for the Foley's. What quickly strikes the viewer of this piano is the skilled artisan labor congealed on its highly worked surfaces in regard to which Thorsten Veblen in 1899 put his finger on the relation between prestige and specialized craft labor. Hand labor, Veblen commented, is a more wasteful method of production, hence the goods turned out by this method are more serviceable for the purpose of pecuniary re reputability. Hence the marks of hand labor come to be honorific, and the goods which exhibit these marks take rank as of a higher grade than the corresponding machine product. 
Singularity is the principal characteristic of the Foley Grand's elaborate neo-Rococo case and gilt neo-Baroque undercarriage with four legs, not the three that characterize modern grand pianos, an amalgamation of French taste and the reversal of history. Visually commanding, the instrument is a nostalgic throwback to the Ancien Regime, a visual statement on behalf of old money at the expense of the nouveau riche. Money, yes, bloodline, no. That is, the piano's case advertises the family's distinguished past as if to insist on the security of its future in the face of profound social, political, economic, and cultural transformation then sweeping England as the epicenter of the early industrial revolution. Accordingly, there is a bizarre logic to the case's decorative scheme, which besides incorporating comic grotesqueries, such as monkey musicians, on a more serious note, intermixes allusion to mythological deities, the face of Apollo, Venus, Diana, Aeolus, Ceres, Bacchus, Persephone, etched in ivory, and in a full miniature sculpture on the understretcher, either Orpheus or Apollo with lyre and with family in lineage, various coats of arms extending back at least nine generations, as though the Foley's owned property on Mount Olympus, as though their ancestors once cavorted with the muses, and maybe even witnessed the original manifestations of music charming the animals, thanks to the virtuosity of Orpheus. Veblen again. The wealth of power of the leisure class, he said, must be put in evidence, for esteem is awarded only on evidence. The instrument takes control of its surroundings. Nothing competes well against it. It overwhelms, ironically, even before it sounds, or again, even if it doesn't. The piano likewise demonstrates dominion over a geographical space that lies far beyond the domestic setting, to the extent that the case is decorated with various exotic materials garnered from throughout the colonized world. Ivory from India or Africa, ebony and satinwood from Southeast, uh, Southern Asia, mahogany, various tropical regions from Central America to Africa and the Philippines, tulip wood, South America, as well as holly, burl walnut, and mother of pearl, all of it in a, t a tangible metaphor of the global strength of England, Europe's greatest imperial power. The case of the Foley Grand is grand to astounding excess, even by the standards of its time. Eyes passing over its surfaces confirm, seeing is believing, what money can buy, namely the time of highly skilled artisans. The instrument's worked surfaces encode a dramatic expenditure of physical labor. The degree to which these materials are worked, often with torturous exactness and delicacy, silently affirms the Foley's class status, dependent alike on the mutually enforcing combination of wealth and an aggressively projected sense of taste. In the end, to be sure, the instrument itself suggests rather little about music, by which here I mean sound. But it says a good deal about how music and art can be called into the service of personal politics. In brief, the Foley Grand is a hallmark for what would later be called conspicuous consumption, established on the principle that too much is nowhere near enough. <laughs> a square piano required considerably less space uh, than a large grand, but as a domestic collectible, it could still make quite a considerable visual statement. Better suited to a townhouse than a country mansion, this vastly overwrought, singularly ostentatious hunk of carved rosewood of American manufacture was exhibited in 1851 at the Crystal Palace Industrial Arts Exhibition where it won a first prize, which is to suggest that its decorative vocabulary fit the moment in response to a cultural need, one anchored in contradiction. Like the Foley Grand, the square piano asserts a wholeheartedly materialist world order, but one mapped onto whatever aesthetic claims can be put into the service, uh, into service on the basis of the music's sonic immateriality, which all too conveniently served as a cultural stand-in for spirituality in an age that made spirituality fungible. Put differently, this piano is an instantiation of precisely what contemporaneous aesthetics otherwise preferred to insist that music was not. Ironically, the instrument's deadly weighty massiveness provides ample evidence that its keyboard and what the keyboard activates is nearly an afterthought, which is to suggest that music's spiritualizing quotient in the art religion of the period aesthetics all too easily could serve to promote the very crass materialism and social rapaciousness that the arts and music especially were otherwise charged at least to mitigate, if not to subvert. In point of fact, however, the relationship of keyboard instruments to cultural and social organization long predate the 19th century. 
And I'd like to trace two different but related aspects of this relationship by arcing back to the early modernity of the 17th century, foregoing the piano for its predecessor, the harpsichord, and briefly consider how keyboard instruments typically associated with domestic culture are imbricated in statements about force and power. The most accomplished builders of virginals and harpsichords in the Low Countries during this period were the several members of the Rutgers family. Their splendid instruments are well known not least for their decoration, especially the employment of Latin mottos, uh, block printed on paper and glued onto the case. For the most part, the mottos that the Rutgers or other builders of the place and time employed were benign, of the sort that you see here, for example, uh, and I'm referring to this. So here's a typical motto. I was once an ordinary tree, although living I was silent. Now, though dead, if I am well played, I sound sweetly. But there are exceptions. Some instruments carry warnings that tend towards threat. Two surviving Rutgers instruments, for example, declare an imperative likewise recorded in this period painting. Uh, you should be able to, yeah. Audi vide et tace, si vis visere in pace, that is, listen, watch, and be silent if you wish to live in peace. <laughs> now, this motto can be read in several ways, and its very ambiguity uh, may well be a determining factor in its use. At a minimum, the message invites vigilance and in a language of privilege, Latin, not the vernacular, but the language of ancient Roman authority, Pax Romana, and the modern Catholic Church, official language, in other words. The motto's insistence on vigilance is anchored in consequence. Without vigilance, peace is supplanted by its presumed opposite, chaos, or even war, of which more in a minute. The motto invokes hearing and looking, but its real advice is to listen, in effect, to spy, if on oneself, self-surveillance, as it were. As a general order during fraught times, of which the European 17th century is a classic example, the motto assertively offers strategic advice. In the end, the radical ambiguity of the text helps to establish its overriding point. That is, precisely because the world is so unstable, threat might come from anywhere, only uncertainty is, so, is certain, so take care. But why the advice to remain quiet? The imperative asserts the importance of close listening. That is, keep your mouth shut and your ears open. Sounds mean, the motto suggests. Sounds have consequences. Sounds require interpretation. But then again, why all this on a musical instrument? Perhaps because all sounds mean, so to speak, even songs without words. Put differently, the aesthetic has agency in the social and cultural realm of order, though in whose interest is without guarantee. The decoration of harpsichords with Latin texts is often supplemented with case paintings, main, uh, many featuring Apollo, often in the company of the muses. But sometimes on a single instrument, he makes a second appearance, as here, in a different uh, musical story, his context with Pan, a comic story. Pan loses the context, uh, contest and, and grows donkey ears as his punishment. He's made a fool for the price of losing. But Apollo also uh, enjoins a far darker musical contest, this one with the satyr Marsyas, whose punishment for challenging Apollo's musicianship and losing the contest, if only because Apollo in fact cheated his way to victory, is to be flayed alive. And this trope too, if more rarely, shows up on painted harpsichords. Now just so you see what I'm talking about, so here is Apollo, here is, um, here is uh, Marsyas, he's been flayed, and here is Apollo holding his entire surface of skin. This trope, if more rarely, also shows up as a painted decoration on a harpsichord. This is a part of a surviving harpsichord lid. The Apollo Marsyas story, by modern standards, might seem singularly inappropriate for a domestic musical instrument, that is, showing a flaying of a human being, but this was hardly the case in early modernity. Now, along the same lines, near the end of the 17th century, a painter named Adam Franz van der Mullen, a specialist of battle scene paintings, 
decorated the case of a large double manual French harpsichord formerly ascribed to Hans Rookers. In this instance, war and putative peace reside together in a forced relation of profound visual dissonance that asserts a bond beyond, be, between the art of music and the art of war. The main scene on the inside of the harpsichord's lid showed a mount, shows a mounted entourage with a king riding at the head. He is uh, Louis XIV, the Sun King, the monarch whose self-chosen emblem was the young Apollo, uh, no accident, as the face of the flaming sun. That is to say, this is a portrait of Louis as a young man, but as Apollo. A walled town appears in the background, though no battle uh, is in actual progress, but there's a sense that something is about to happen evident by the repeated inclusion of galloping horses, their tails stretched out behind to indicate speed and the insistence with which they move, always like a text from left to right and out of the frame following a path paralleling the picture plane. On the instrument's sides, similar scenes are replicated, but the viewpoint is raised somewhat, somewhat approximating bird's eye level of period siege pictures. In the first instance, a siege is in preparation. In the second panel, a town is under attack. In this extraordinary visual conceit, force and imputed violence become the agents of art. Um, a panorama of unrelenting maleness, the scenes together literally frame and direct the sonorities produced by the harpsichord. Violence and art music visually and sonorically answer to the cause of mutual justification. Stated otherwise, order may be aesthetically realized, order may also be socially imposed. But in the end, it's order that counts. The insistence on order relayed through aesthetic representation helps explain the otherwise grotesque, virtually comic uh, use of gigantic ears at the bottom of an engraving representing hearing as the title exists. But what is really at stake, what is heard and by what means, that is, the print from which this is taken claims to illustrate a human sense, namely hearing, a trope very popular in the visual arts of the time, but its real subject is listening. So what you have is an ensemble of musicians, but in the background, what you have is a war scene. Um, and there is uh, an intended relationship between the two, and in the background, you see uh, a, uh, a castle, you see it here, you see it here, that is, seats of power. And so you have this juxtaposition between art on the one hand and a very peaceful quasi-domestic interior, but in the background, in essence, a commentary on what makes all of this possible. That is what makes art possible, and it is uh, basically uh, an explanation of state power. The ancient metaphor of a cosmos defined by the harmony of mathematical relationships is invoked, overlaid with an imagined frosting, the sweetness of sonorities that affirm the classical fantasy of an ideal social ecology. The Latin text uh, to this print acknowledges uh, personal glory via uh, nature imagery. So what I'm referring to here is there's a text in Latin, a, te a text in French that accompanies this print. The Latin text builds to an acknowledgement of personal glory via nature imagery, while the language itself confirms the authority of the secular ancients and the Catholic moderns. The French verse, linguistically current, reiterates culture around a platonic ideal. The two worlds, seemingly interchangeable, articulate the pleasures congruent with a peace defined explicitly by power, privilege, and control, a peace to be sure not universally enjoyed. Now, this brings me back to the fraught matter of music and gender. Briefly stated, the cultural linkage between music, uh, between music and women, specifically wives, was already established in Western European societies by the 17th century. This link provided a dependable reference point for men, specifically husbands, for expressing a deep ambivalence and even at worst, a loathing for women. Here again, decorative harpsichord mottos directly engage gender difference by means of a male lament about marriage relations. To take a wife is to sell one's freedom. Now again, this is on a harpsichord. This age-old cliche is inscribed onto the one piece of household furniture that commonly came as a gift to the wife from her husband. It argues that her music is the sonoric language of his imprisonment, music, woman, as captivation. 
This abusive judgment shares a connection to another motto, this time in Italian and on an Italian instrument, which reads, I receive form from the blows I receive. In this instance, the virginal, anthropomorphized as woman, is made woman by the violence imposed upon her. Music is posited as harmony, but harmony is produced as a beating. Aestheticized as music, woman's very being is articulated as the product of a deferential masochism in response to sadistic revenge. Now, moving forward in time, two more pianos and another insta instantiation of power relations, those in the home and concerning gender. The first is a very small upright pianino built by the London firm of Priestley around 1860. Unquestionably a domestic instrument, it's significant on account of its case decoration executed by the artist Edward Byrne Jones, the instrument's original owner, who received it as a marriage gift from his aunt. The instrument was regularly played by his young wife. At the far right of the open lid, hence always remaining in sight, even when music sits on the rack, Byrne Jones produced a small scene of a woman personifying love, playing a small organ whose bellows are worked by an angel. But stretching entirely across the, instru across the instrument's lower front, a very different if bizarre scene of young women, two musicians and their auditors in a walled garden enclosure to which death seeks entrance at the gate. Now, odd as it might seem at first glance, the two images are related. One is quite small, the other large and imposing, if nonetheless set in the dark recess of the instrument's lower half. The darkness of the second image is exacerbated by the predominant browns and golds of its palette, I'm sorry I don't have a color image, in sharp contrast to the white costumes or, uh, worn by the two upper figures who form a surprisingly bright spot on a cabinet made from American walnut. Byrne Jones connects the two images by a visually jarring color binary, light, dark. The degree of difference between the two poles attracts notice. The issues of difference, the ground to which this binary is anchored, in turn depends upon an additional binary well established in Western theology and philosophy, namely life, body, lower, against afterlife, soul, higher. But the body in question is gendered. It's only the female body that is subject to the evaluating, devalorizing gaze. Further, whereas the painting is in effect philosophical in its discourse, abstract as it were, its metaphorical content is transferred visually to functional reality via the actual woman who sits before it, namely the painter's bride. In some weird way, music provides her with transport from her baseness as a woman whose role is to cower in the garden among the other women and wait for death, patriarchal crowned as a king, to disembodied and sexless status as a white-gowned virginal female. The image's montage signifies rather in the manner of a slash film with a musical soundtrack, wherein the narrative describes the good bride as a dead one. The scythe carried by uh, death is enormous, and Byrne Jones highlights the blade's a uh, edge. I'm sorry, this isn't very visible in a black and white photograph. It's profoundly threatening. Byrne Jones takes his aunt wedding gift and redecorates it to serve as a visual discourse addressed to and presumably evaluating his, his uh, wife. Uh, there's, a, there's a story, by the way, about Byrne Jones that when he first saw his, uh, his wife naked, um, he was appalled uh, to discover that she had uh, pubic hair, which usually in paintings, of course, was uh, uh, painted out, um, and um, that he was horrified. Um, so you can make of that what you wish. The problem that Byrne Jones painted, the, the problem that Byrne Jones's uh, painted piano engages is woman and the problem is music. Music is a problem precisely because the culture gendered it as feminine. As such, it was simultaneously a source of bliss to men, but also a threat. The presumed narrative of the lower panel doesn't take up its, uh, uh, does not take up its story in Medius Race so much as it rushes us towards a conclusion, as though we already knew what preceded this highly dramatic event. Blood is about to flow. But is it inevitable? Is it just deserts? Whatever the answer, other questions are raised only so as not to be answered. Does woman music cause the visit of death, or is death's visit inevitable, temporarily held off by woman music? The answers can't be known. But the scythe cuts flesh. Its promised whore fixes our gaze on its shining metal, rendered perhaps more transfixing, because the man who wields it will enter the women's space by knocking on their gate, as it were, under false pretense, like a neighbor gone mad. 
The end result is the transportation of the women and their music to the celestial sphere above. This is the better place. Presumably, this is the better women, woman. We know that from the iconographical tradition of St. Cecilia. And this is better music. The trouble is that this better woman is disembodied, and the safer celestial music she makes can't be heard. Now, the second piano is a concert grand built by Alexandre Charpentier in 1902. Its case is painted by the Art Nouveau artist Albert Besnard. The instrument's decoration constitutes a lurid visual summary of the story I'm telling. By virtue of its size, this is less a, dr a domestic instrument than one appropriate for the public stage. And yet, on account of its decoration, notably the inside of the lid, it's an instrument that must be kept from the sight of at least minor children. It's explicitly private. Thus, the instrument stands isolated, not only between two musical traditions, classical and popular, sacred and profane, but also between the amateur, female, domestic and private on the one hand, and the professional, male and public on the other. The piano provides a visual discourse on music best fitted for a men's club. And yet its visual discourse is at once apparently contradictory and, and paradoxically logical. The instrument's lid is like a Victorian photographic album of erotica, best kept closed. To open it is to engage in a sexual musical implicitly forbidden pleasure. The woman's body is swept over by golden-edged water music that engages her sexu sexually, erotically washing between her legs, drawing attention to the swelling, swelling form of her pelvic area, while at the same time threatening to drown her. Hence her contorted arms and grotesquely twisted fingers. Her gesture incorporates the body, the body rhetoric of fending off an attack. Indeed, her outspread fingers are an old pictorial convention used to represent women's horror of impending rape. At the same time, ambivalence is suggested by the painter's handling of her legs, for the left one is raised in such a way as to encourage the movement of the wave between her thighs, a metaphoric and voluntary penetration. Moreover, her body is composed as though she were a Venus or odalisque reclining on a bed, sexually available and willing, and thus her upper body resists, her lower body admits. She is constituted as both Madonna and whore, a then popular trope about women. The sides of the case provide a striking contrast laid out in strip fashion, which taken together constitute a detailed discourse clarifying and amplifying this primary text on the lid. Unlike the flowing and relatively fuzzy upper image, the small subsidiary scenes they wrap all the way around the piano are painted with exacting precision. Like footnotes, they gloss and anchor what otherwise might remain obscure. They purport to provide closure. Their subject matter, contextualizing the lid painting, involves a narrative of marriage, adultery, and murder. Sex concatenates with death. The infamy of the faithless woman is joined to music, that is the grand piano itself. Among the various scenes are iteration of male resolve, involving a, including a battle scene wherein masculine authority is emphasized in the form of a pawing stallion. Uh, there are angry men at war, faithless women punished, the warrior hero responding to the antagonisms of desire, women, and music. The visual sonoric pleasure enacted on the piano's lid will be paid by the death of the one who provides the pleasure. She's woman, she's music. But ironically, with the death of the woman, there follows the end of the auditor gazer's pleasure. Once the lid is closed, like a coffin prepared for burial, the sight of her body and the waves of music washing over her are sealed off so that the loss is ours. Music is the lover, the lover is despised. Melody is gone, so is woman. Order is restored. With the death of desire, there follows the end of music in an implicit paradigm whereby men surrender music in the interest of retaining domination with the ironic result that domination dominates them in the bargain. And now to close with a look back to where we started. In order to get uh, to the here and now of our own time, two works by Armand Pierre Fernandez Armand one of a baby grand piano cast in bronze, and in another constructed from bits and pieces of a piano sufficiently broken and fragmented as to leave one wondering what it was to start with. What can't be imagined in these works is a statement that even remotely re uh, resembles the world claimed or fantasized by the two intact pianos with which I began these remarks. But what's odd and distinctly affecting at least uh, about the first of these objects, entitled The Last Chord, They Wouldn't Let Me Play Carnegie Hall, 
is that it seems powerfully to invoke music, despite music's profound, indeed, absolute absence. That is, the broken piano speaks the sounds of which it is no longer capable by marking laws. The Foley Grand and its square analog are, or once were, fully playable. But in the absence of their being played, they seem oddly mute, dead. The second sculptural assemblage, titled Chopin's Waterloo, is a piano in pieces, broken, finally defeated, hence final Waterloo. But however weirdly, it somehow seems to me anyway, still to sing, if, in an, if an apparent lament. Armand's pianos speak plainly to modern society and its classical music culture. The same holds for the historical instruments I've discussed, but with a difference. The social relations of the historical instruments are hidden behind a disguise of aesthetic distraction, furniture, on the one hand, and on the other, at worst, fantasies of authority, authoritarianism, state politics, and outright violence aestheticized, and gender inequality blatantly proclaimed, and not least, all of it made somehow musical. Armand sculptures lift the veil from the pretense, the pretend, and the nastiness. In late modernity, the subject-object relation is marked by the reality that objects increasingly define the very terms of what it is to be a human subject. Objects are the agents of subjectivity, hence identity, there in the principle of commodity fetishism. The pianos, grand and square, with which I began, duly mark this principles, principle, Armand's pianos, critique it. Thank you. <laughs>